Hello, my name is Father Edward Looney, and you are listening to the podcast, How They Love Mary, a podcast that I hope will either be the beginning or the deepening of your Marian devotion. Religious sisters have a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Many of them, and the two sisters I'll be speaking with today, have taken Mary as the first part of their name in religion. And so, Surely Mary watches over the religious community of the Benedictine Sisters of Mary, Queen of Apostles, and they have a new book, a children's book, that is out now called Brides of Christ. And today I am speaking with Sister Mary Josepha of the Eucharist and Sister Maria Batista of the Holy Ghost. And they are members of the religious community. In fact, I've actually been to Gower, Missouri, uh, once uh, I was I, I was a student at Conception Abbey, and at one point I, I made my way to Gower, and uh, it's my understanding that the sisters have even expanded, and we'll talk about that now shortly. So thanks so much, sisters, for taking time out of your monastic life to join me today. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Father. We're glad to speak with you. Well, it's wonderful, you know, and I've actually wanted to have cloistered sisters on but I've never had like a cloistered sister commit to it. Like they always were like, no, no, we don't want to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but here you are the perfect opportunity because you have this new children's book, Bride of Brides of Christ that is now available from Sophia Institute Press. And maybe just, uh, I, I want to set the scene a little bit. Could you share a little bit about the Benedictine sisters of Mary, Queen of Apostles? Sure. So our community has the charism to uh, pray for priests, to sacrifice for priests, much after the example of Our Lady, whom after our Lord's ascension, lived a very quiet, hidden life in Ephesus, uh, present day Turkey. And she provided a spiritual center for the early church and a place where the apostles would come back for spiritual refreshment. Perhaps you remember St. Paul saying, I will tarry at Ephesus. There's no doubt that he was visiting Our Lady there. And so we try to emulate that life, to be love in the heart of the church, as St. Therese said, and to be a place of spiritual refreshment for priests, um, also for the lady who will often come for visits or on retreat. Yeah, and you mentioned Ephesus just now in that co in our little conversation about your religious community. and. That's something that is really a part of your your monastic life is uh, you have CDs that are out or now you can listen to them, you know, on any streaming platform or whatever. But uh, I, I have them. I thoroughly enjoy them. You have Easter at Ephesus, Advent at Ephesus. So uh, the sisters are very much known for singing. Is that right? And uh, the really the publication of these CDs that really help so many people to pray uh, as they listen to your angelic voices. Well, thanks be to God. We sing every day for our Lord, eight times a day in the chapel. And so it's something that we do quite naturally as an expression of our love and our adoration of God. And so the CDs are a way that we've tried to share that life of prayer that we have with the laity. And I'm glad to hear that it is inspiring in some way that um, they can share our liturgical prayer with us. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, you sing to our Lord eight times a day. So we call this the divine office. And yeah. So there's, um, I, I'm going to use the English words, but you know, there's office of readings, there's morning prayer lauds, then there's the three daytime hours, then there's evening prayer vespers and then night prayer complements. So, so lots of, lots of prayer. So what is the typical day of, a Benedictine sister of Mary, Queen of the Apostles. What What's a day like for you? And maybe how does the book Brides of Christ, this book for children, capture the day in the life of a Benedictine sister? Um, well, we begin the day, as you said, uh, with matins. But getting up, um, the first thought is lifting our hearts to God. Um, and then the way to express that is immediately you know in the dark to go straight to our lord um and the book i think in this way shows um like how it begins with the the young girl joining the convent like all she wants to do is praise our lord with her life and 
and we sing that in the office um i will i will praise you i will bless you O lord with my life and that's what at least the book is trying to show um that's what the image is even though they're very childlike they're trying to show that um the the praise is not only with our voices but it's with our lives and and the divine office seems to capture our whole religious life so from matins from when we enter um seeking like running to to seek our lord and then throughout the day you know with uh, the little hours and um vespers um we're growing in our religious life and maturing and you know you get the different veils and and then solemn profession um it seems like you're entering into your vespers and compline um going towards the end of your life and um and compline is it's such a wonderful thing because you have to put so much trust in our lord and it's like you know falling asleep you have to just let everything go and mm. And that's kind of how you come to the end of the book because it is a, a it's a solid profession and it's a it's a um, the complement of the soul. So at the end of the religious life, hopefully you've you've uh, abandoned everything to our Lord, like like how you do at Compline. In a certain way, you've realized eternity. In a way, yeah, <laughs> you put all your life into God at that point. That's very beautiful reflections on religious life, and so. Uh, you have this young girl and she's entering the monastery. Is there like a page or two about what made her want to join the monastery? <laughs> um, there's nothing else that would make anyone join a monastery other than love of God. It's our Lord who draws a soul. Um, and I don't know, anyone, everyone has their own vocation stories and, you know, the different parts of the world and different uh, modes of life, but it's all a, a love story. Um, it's our Lord, the divine lover, calling the soul and drawing it. And it's like a proposal. Yes. Um, yeah. And perhaps that um, the, the specific monastic vocation is an invitation to live in God's house. And I think that Sister's Pictures tried to draw that out when the little girl goes through life, just seeing our Lord in all the aspects of the day, whether the, the silent work or the sung prayer, the recreations, all these different things she's seeing our lord and knowing that she's really living in his house quite close to him now is the young girl who's in the story is she just an anonymous person or is she modeled off of one of the sisters in the monastery <laughs> i think i think it was um a mixture of, of different sisters and different experiences and my own too um i think we all had that like longing even just for the first um uh the, for becoming a postulant just a small step of just becoming one of the sisters or you know going from your lay clothes to just all black and it, it's it's a it seems like a small step but it's really um uh, it steps becoming to becoming one of the benedictines of mary and placing yourself under the care of our lady and that's when you receive the miraculous medal and it's it, it seems like a small thing that like you get your miraculous medal but it's really our lady taking you under her mantle. I think that each of us could look at the pictures of the little girl and think, yes, that was how I felt. That was how mm. I felt. Yeah. Now, there are specific pictures that we can point to and say, now that's sister yes. so-and-so. Because <laughs> <laughs> sister so-and-so used a chainsaw. Yes. <laughs> or the, the whole mopping incident with the sisters bonking into each other, that was not made up. That was no, a real that incident. Was, that was a real incident. <laughs> Inspired by true events. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Uh, Very and, true. and also the the little the postulant with the veil oh, <laughs> the, ca the, the little cow cat, in the veil uh chewing on the veil that's a true story <laughs> so uh, there's not a lot of poetic license in that book yes sure so tell me what what time do the sisters wake up and what time is your first prayer in the day our first prayer is about 5 a.m we get up a little bit before five and as sister said we go right to the chapel and begin our sung prayer and actually the first three hours of the day are a very sacred time of prayer. So we go from the sung prayer of the divine office to private prayer and Lexio Divina, and then go back for more sung prayer. And that's the first three hours of the day. And then after that, 
we go to our various duties, whether in the kitchen or the garden or the sewing room, and all of that work we try to do in silence. Um, there's a little bit of talking maybe to give directions yeah. to say, sister, will you please get the veil out of the cat's mouth yeah. <laughs> or something like that. But again, we try to keep the silence so that we can continue to talk with God in our hearts throughout the day and we continue to listen for his voice. Our meals are taken in silence. So there's a picture about the monastic meal, I think. Um, you see the sisters being served and a, another sister reading while the sisters are eating. Um, and that's to remind us that even when we take physical nourishment for the body, we can't leave off the spiritual nourishment for the soul. So we listen to uh, Life of a Saint or some other spiritual book. Um, we do have an hour a day when we talk. Uh, so that's our recreation. And it might be we go for a walk or we do some manual work. But either way, the important thing is to talk <laughs> for recreation. <laughs> and laugh. And laugh. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard it said you can judge the health of a religious community by how loud its recreations are. <laughs> so okay. we like to think that ours is a healthy community. <laughs> Um, and then at the end of the day, we pray Compline, we entrust everything to Our Lady, and we go back into that grand silence that's, that lasts until all of the morning prayers are finished the next day. So for your religious community, you would be considered a cloistered religious order, is that right? Yes. And then do you have a grill? Have, so, uh, so if someone was going to come and visit you, would they have to visit you behind a grill? No, there are two sorts of enclosure. So the papal enclosure has the grill okay. and it's a, it has more um, e external signs of the separation of the nun from the world, like the grill, like the enclosure wall. We have what's called constitutional enclosure, which is more suited for our charism to pray for priests and to provide a place of retreat for them. If we were behind a grill, we couldn't keep a retreat house and cook for them mm. and things like that. So uh, when we discerned our call that we would be monastic women dedicated to Our Lady of Ephesus with this charism to pray and minister for priests, we decided that the constitutional enclosure was better for that than the papal enclosure. Now, what drew you two sisters to your religious community? I'm sure that as one who is discerning, maybe you visited a few other religious orders. Maybe you visited, I have a friend that's a, a fully professed sister of the Poor Claire Cullitines in Rockford, Illinois. So that's papal enclosure. So um, did, did you visit other communities or did you always know that the Benedictine Sisters of Mary, Queen of the Apostles was for you? Uh, we, I'm sure we could each say different things about that. Um, for my story, I, when I was at school, I, I was blessed to experience the recitation of the Divine Office according to the Benedictine uh, breviary. So I fell in love with that way of praying. Um, I found the sung psalmody, the antiphons, it just resonated with me. And so that narrowed my search quite a bit. <laughs> there are not very many traditional Benedictine communities for women. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for our community, we're the only traditional Benedictine community for women in the English speaking world which explains why we have many um, internationals. So um, for me, the, the way of prayer drew me. Um, I did visit some other communities and I, I loved them. I found them very beautiful, but they sort of reinforced that I was still longing for the Benedictine office. And I, I loved the rhythm of the day alternating between work and prayer. Um, and I might add to the Benedictine life is has a family spirituality so the community sees it itself very much as a family united around the superior who is in the person of christ um, we do everything together we pray together we work together we recreate together um, and so these things all um how can i say it? they just resonated with me um i'm sure sister has similar experience maybe yeah, what others. about you sister <laughs> no i think it runs us a, a, a little bit the same. Um, I think there was something very in, internally drawing me to the Benedictine life, the, the divine office, especially. There was a great reverence, I think, um, for it. It just seemed like this grand prayer. I don't know that um, that was so beautiful, like you couldn't really even uh, touch it or describe it. 
Um, but then I think after that, I did visit a few other communities, but uh, I think my thought was um, there weren't Marian enough. <laughs> um, like, I, I, I didn't see, even though they did have a love for Our Lady, but it, it wasn't like how I saw it for the Benedictines of Mary. I remember seeing one, uh, I think it was a picture and <laughs> on the cake, I think it was on the um, investiture of one of the sisters and it said, Totus twos. And I thought, wow, that's, that's basically what I want to be all uh, our lords through Our Lady. And that was a, that was a strong deciding factor. Like um, they belong to Our Lady, like Benedictines of Mary. And, um, and yeah. I might add to that, we say a Hail Mary before each task that we have work and prayer and other things throughout the day before our recreation. And we always add to that Hail Mary. I am all thine, yeah. that totus tuus that sister said. I am all thine and all that I have is thine. You mentioned that your religious community attracts a lot of women, partly because, as you mentioned, you're the only traditional Benedictine community in the in the English-speaking world. So um, it's my understanding from what I read is that your order is expanding. So not only are you in Gower, Missouri, but now do you have another foundation in Ava, Missouri? Is that right? Or did I misread that? Yes. No, and that's actually where we are. We are at the daughter house in Ava, Missouri. Okay. So our mother house was built for 48 sisters and we reached capacity in 2019. So Mother Abbas sent six of us down south to Southern Missouri to start St. Joseph's Monastery. And we've been here now four years. We're 12 sisters now. You've doubled. And the mother house yeah, the mother's house is also at capacity again, and our temporary uh, monastery is getting quite cozy. Yes. <laughs> We're practically on top of each other. So Mother Abbas wisely broke ground on the permanent monastery. Um, and of course, it's a terrible time to try to build um, with the inflation and everything, but she's very confident that St. Joseph will be our business manager and he will get the funds that we need. And that's right. So, um, yeah, and Ava, Missouri is very interesting because they had a Trappist order of monks um, for, for a very long yes. time, uh, but but they aren't there anymore, I think. And then like some maybe a Vietnamese Trappist order came or something like that. So 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 you're aware of their yes. presence. Huh? Yes, we're actually renting our temporary monastery from Assumption Abbey. So okay. we're on their property. Oh um, wow. There are only two Trappists. Yes, there are only two Trappists left who are living out their vows. Um, but the Vietnamese Cistercians made a foundation and they were given the keys to the monastery when we arrived four years ago. As you're preparing to build a new monastery in Ava to replace your temporary one, uh, how many sisters do you expect that one to hold or, or to be able to house? It will be for 48 sisters, just like the mother house. That's beautiful. And then I'm sure that maybe over time, you'll even have to expand and build another monastery. <laughs> yes, we actually have a, a tentative third house. It's not a permanent house yet, but the Bishop of Wichita invited us to have a presence in his diocese. Oh, that's so some wonderful. of the sisters from Gower will go to Wichita. Yes, it's not a permanent foundation yet, but there'll be six of them praying at a, a little house that he has there. Um, so it's it's the beginnings. <laughs> well, how beautiful. So uh, I, I guess, too, as you've written, the order has written, and, and there's another person that collaborated, uh, a, a layman, from what I gather. Uh, why was it that the sisters felt called to write this children's book? Why Why put this book out there? and get it in the hands of young readers? Well, Sister Maria Batista <laughs> has always liked to doodle and she has a, a gift, I think, for capturing the joy of our life. Um, and it seemed an appropriate way to share the interior life that we have with the people outside and maybe to spark some more vocations. Yeah. I think cloistered life is an unnecessary mystery for many people. And this sure. little book, it might spark the vocation in another young heart, and it might also help her family to understand that vocation that she starts to feel. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this book, and I'm like, well, how beautiful would it be that in 18 or 20 years from now, 
a sister enters the community and <laughs> says, I read Brides of Christ. Yeah. And from that day on, I knew I wanted to be a Benedictine sister of Mary. I think that'd be a beautiful, <laughs> a beautiful gift. Yes, indeed. Yes, our Lord can call souls in, in various ways. And <laughs> yes. um, yeah, he's he's amazing like that, that he can take uh, little drawings like that and, and, and draw good from it. Yeah. So, um, so when people pick up the book, what, what, what's the basic storyline? It just follows this young girl going through the religious life and the day-to-day -day life of a sister. Is that kind of a good synopsis? Uh, yes. So from, from the beginnings of when she enters, um, the day-to-day -day life, and then also her, her growth in the religious life. So becoming a posh slant and, um, then becoming a novice and then anticipating to make uh, first vows and then solemn vows. Um, so yeah, it, it does go through the, the whole synopsis of the, of the religious life of the Benedictines of Mary anyway. Yeah, I definitely think that this book Brides of Christ is going to help, as you mentioned, other people just understand your way of life. I think maybe some people look at it from the outside and like, why, why do they live like this? Why, what makes them choose to live this way? And so telling this story and telling it for children, because a children's book isn't just for children. It's for the mothers or the grandmothers <laughs> that read it to them. It's for the adults. It's for, for lots of different types of people. So um, you're going to be reaching just more than young minds. You're going to be uh, touching other people as well and informing them about your way of life. Yes, I, I hope they, uh, sister said, they do see the joy and peace in our life. Um, it's such a gift to be a, a Benedictine of Mary. And it's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to share that with others. Yeah, and uh, as you prepare to build this new monastery in Ava, uh, I'm assuming that probably some proceeds of this children's book are going to go towards that. But if people want to support this project and support your community, they can just go to your website and make a donation. Is that correct? Yes. And there are many, um, there are many ways to support us as the website shows there's um, we have the CDs, the book that's just been released and some other uh, gift shop type things. There's also the vestments that we make for priests. That's the way we support ourselves by the work of our hands. Um, and then there are different commemorative opportunities also for the new monastery. If people wish to sponsor part of the building or have their name on the sponsorship plaque, or even to have um, fathers and grandfathers, spiritual fathers remembered at the father's shrine, perhaps you've heard the our monastery will have the national shrine for fathers joined to it. At the Monastery of St. Joseph, it seemed appropriate to have this commemorative opportunity for fathers. So this oh, wow. would be a way to have your loved ones remembered in the prayers of the Benedictines. Uh, today on How They Love Mary, I have been speaking with, I've been blessed by the opportunity to speak with two Benedictine sisters of Mary, Queen of Apostles, uh, based in Missouri, Gower and Ava. We've learned about Brides of Christ, and I really encourage you to share this story about their monastery, about their way of life with the young people in your life. It's recently released from Sophia Institute Press. So head on over to wherever you buy Catholic books and get Brides of Christ today. So thanks so much for joining me on How They Love Mary. And let us remain united in prayer to Jesus through Mary. God bless.